Hey guys, LC Holt here, and this is my update for the week of December the 24th. Only two more weeks left in 2018, so we got two more shows. Tonight's show is going to be a good one because I, for really the first time ever in this sort of a format, I'm going to be talking about the making of my film, Spiritus. But I'm not going to be doing that alone because we're actually going to be talking about the making of two films. My film, Spiritus and the film The Nobodies, which was directed and written by my good friend Jay Burleson. Jay, how you doing tonight, man? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be back. Always, always fun. The last show we did was a lot of fun. And, and this one should be really interesting because we're actually going to take the viewer through the process of making these two films, Spiritus in my case and The Nobodies in your case. And of course, naturally, we'll start with the pre-production of those movies. So. Um, right. And, and the conception of the idea, which I think is something that's that's interesting. Uh, do you want to go first? Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Absolutely. Um, so with the nobodies, I was uh, I just moved into my own apartment. I kind of been living with uh, my friend Bart Hyatt, who's in the nobodies for a while. And then I lived with uh, another actor in the movie, Randy Hill, who if you, you've seen the film, he's in the documentary at the very beginning. He's kind of the biker dude that's interviewed and says that, Warren Warner would basically, he would put anything on film, like nudity wise, didn't matter if their boots were hanging down to the knees. So I lived on that guy, that guy's spare bedroom. And so I was at my own place and my dad had just sold my childhood home and he was bringing over these boxes of um, my old stuff from when I was a kid. And a lot of it was VHSC tapes um, from short films I'd made like in junior high and high school. And I started watching them, and oddly enough, all the main characters from the note or from Pumpkin, the movie within the movie, were featured in those early works. So, like uh, Tabaris DeWitt, a, a much milder version of that character, was in a short I made. Johnny Knickerbocker was in a short where his arm was sawed off by a clown and a man wearing a pumpkin, like an actual pumpkin. So I changed some things, but like all those characters were in these shorts. So I started watching them. I was twenty two at the time when I was watching this stuff. And it really gave me uh, a lot of excitement about how I used to make movies because I was trying to be more professional, you know, in my early twenties, but in high school, you would just grab your camera, grab your friends and go do whatever, you know, and just like shoot a movie in a night and that would be it. And you would sell it to your friends at school or whatever on VHS. So I really got fascinated by the idea of, doing that again, but not just doing it with like modern technology, but taking old technology, like the same format VHSC and applying that to a movie that I could make now. So I got the idea for this really bad shot on VHS movie that um, I would basically use all those characters from, and it would be, you know, these different stories that, sort of like an anthology is how I originally approached it. Like there would be the story of Johnny Knickerbocker losing his arm, which in the film is kind of now just a flashback. But originally that was its own 15 minute segment. And then there was the hotel segment with Tavares DeWitt where the roles were reversed. The guy started out as the hitchhiker. And then in the next one, he picked up the hitchhiker. And then the third one was the two killers from the original shorts battling each other. So that's all still pretty much there. It's just not as much of an anthology per se, but I knew that I also didn't just want to do that. I didn't want to just make a bad exploitation movie on VHS because I kind of made a silly vampire movie and transferred it to VHS. And I felt like everyone kind of thought of me as just this like guy who made bad movies, you know? So I started thinking about the idea that this is a lost film and what kind of story could be told about the movie. And that's when it really clicked with me when I thought about Warren Warner, the filmmaker and his girlfriend, Samantha. And I developed this kind of, Based on, you know, growing up, uh, the movies about the two filmmakers end up committing suicide and um, it segments a documentary, a fake documentary segments um, their bad movie that they made. I came up with that idea just basically because I felt, you know, like such an outcast all my life in certain aspects and that people didn't understand me and the weird stuff that I wanted to do. So once I figured out that that was the story that Warren and Samantha commit suicide and their movies kind of lost forever and it's kind of unearthed through the making of the nobodies, I just knew that I had something that really spoke to all my sensibilities. And, uh, you know, I think that was like March, April, 2011 is when I came up with it. And I was shooting it by, 
um, the summer of 2011 when we initially started. So that's pretty much how it how it came to be. Now, did you, how long did it take you to write the script? Now, the script is interesting. There, I wouldn't necessarily say there's a script. There's a treatment um, for certain for certain uh, stories in Pumpkin, um, like the the hotel stuff with Tabaris Dewitt and Johnny Knickerbocker was really pretty developed in terms of a treatment. Um, I guess they all were, but then we would get there and just kind of make it up and improv a lot. So there wasn't a script and I felt like, I don't know why I did that, but I'm glad I did in hindsight because I was using some actors, but then also some non-actors and it just made it so much easier when you didn't have them stuck to a script and they could kind of put it in their own words and then we could make it up as we went, like what felt right in the moment. So I feel like uh, if I had written a script for it and it had been too stuck to the words on the page, it would have been really hard to, to get what we ended up with. Yeah, I agree. I think with, with non-actors, sometimes the improvisational approach does work the best. It's, it doesn't intimidate them. Right. And a lot of times they'll, they'll, they'll come up with stuff that you never would have thought of. Absolutely. There's a lot of stuff, you know, with the two detectives um, who are probably my favorite characters in The Nobodies or within Pumpkin. Uh, Art Hyatt, my good friend who I mentioned, plays uh, Jay Course. And then Harold Gilliland, uh, who's just this guy I met through Randy, who I mentioned before as well. He... Um, he had never acted before, and when I first met him, it was over at Randy's house, and I, I thought he didn't like me. He's a really quiet guy in real life. I never thought of him as an actor, but one day we got to talking about, like, cowboy movies and westerns, and he got really excited about the idea of being in a western. So I kind of filed that away. I can go into casting if we want to do a, a segment just to casting, too, because I got some interesting stories about that. But um, I completely lost my train of thought about – but, oh, uh, yeah, Harold would come up with a lot of crazy stuff on his own. And some of it I could use and some of it I couldn't. But uh, he came up with some really funny stuff that's in the movie that I never would have written. Yeah, Harold is an, he is what you never forget, Harold, after you've seen The Nobodies. Right, yeah. He makes a, a strong impression for sure. Absolutely. Um, well, I guess it's my turn. I'll talk about how I came up with Spiritus conceptually. Um, it actually started as a lot of things that I do start it, just with an image that came out of nowhere. And essentially what it was was the image of a girl sitting next to a river uh, with a note. She was writing a note and then, you know, you sort of cut and then she's hanging from a tree. And mm -hmm. I thought, oh, well, she wrote a suicide note and then she hanged herself. And so I kind of had this in my mind and I was thinking about it. <clears throat> and uh, and I, but I didn't really do anything with it, and for probably several several years. And then I came up with the name Spiritus because I was researching something I was writing in prose, a, a short story, and I and I saw that this word Spiritus is a part of a Catholic litany, and it means the living breath. It actually doesn't mean spirit necessarily in in Latin. Yeah, yeah. And I thought I really like that. I was going to ask you about that too. Yeah, I thought that was just so interesting and a provocative, you know, the living breath. It's just like, what does that mean? Um, right. But it's like perfect. a lot. Of, yeah, yeah. And so I, um, <clears throat> so somehow those two ideas, the image of the girl hanging and uh, the, the name Spiritus came together. And what really sparked me into writing the script is when I changed the idea of her having hanged herself to the idea of someone having maybe done it to her. Mm -hmm. And then that, uh, that sparked the thing, because I thought, well, okay, now it can be sort of like a murder mystery with a supernatural element. And that excited me more than just simply a story about a, a, a depressed girl, which it is. Um, and I guess we could mention that, oddly enough, our films, though we, we had, you had nothing to do with Spiritus, and well, right. we, you actually did, but in terms of casting, a very small part, yeah. 
Yeah, but in terms of writing, you know, you were I did the script of Spiritus, you did the Nobodies. Yet, if you watch the two movies together, which is why I think it's interesting for us to be talking about these two movies that it's we made. Far. Yeah, there there are similarities in terms of theme, not in terms of story necessarily, right. but in terms of the theme of it. And um, they're both kind of two movies within one, and both deal with suicide. That's right, because somehow we both made movies that had movies within movies. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, they were, and it did. They both had that documentary movie within a movie type thing. Now, um, so I, I wrote the script, and then you know I got together with some producers who I'd been talking to, who I'd never worked with, but we had talked about working. One of them being Shane Gillis, and then there were a couple others, uh, Josh Carpels and. Uh, and uh, Rick Gardner. And then they were like, well, I showed them the script. I was going to do it myself. And they were like, well, you want to team up on it? And I was like, sure. And so that's how like the production side started going. And then the ca and, and while I'm on this tread, I'll, I'll go ahead and mention that the, the, the uh, contribution you made was actually a really great one because I was banging my head against the wall trying to cast this actor of Wayne. And like everybody we were seeing were like the big redneck, like, I'm going to kick your ass type guys, you know? And yeah. that wasn't really how I saw Wayne as being. And so I, I asked you if you knew of anybody up in, you know, the Birmingham area, anyone that you'd worked with. And you mentioned uh, an actor, Jared Cathrell. Um, Which is odd because I've never actually worked with him. But at the time I had seen uh, Jason Keener's movie and he's the lead in that. And I just had him in my mind and we would run into each other at like sidewalk and stuff like that. So I don't know what it was, man, when you asked that made me think of him, I guess, cause I knew him from Birmingham, but uh, yeah, I, I haven't worked with him, but I hope to eventually work with him one day. Well, it was great because uh, it was perfect casting. And then he auditioned for the movie and very quickly was in it. Um, so I kind of went into some of the casting things. Do you want to talk about the casting of the nobodies? Cause you have some actors in this movie who have to, do some wild things. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess shortly after I came up with the idea and I was so excited about it, the first person I reached out to was Lane Hughes, who plays Johnny Knickerbocker and himself in the documentary portions. And uh, I think I mentioned this last time we talked, but he was actually in Missouri on the set of Your Next when I sent him a Facebook message basically explaining the crazy idea for the movie and being like, do you want to do it? And we'd been friends for a little while at that point. Um, but I don't think we had actually done anything together. Maybe, no, I don't think we'd worked together really at all. Um, unless I'm forgetting some short that we did before the nobodies, but I think that was really the first time we truly collaborated. But um, I knew I wanted him, you know, because we'd been friends for, almost two years at that point, I guess, or at least a year and a half. And we hadn't worked together and he was doing a lot of stuff in the horror genre. So it just made sense for us to finally collaborate on something in that same vein. And um, so he agreed to do it pretty quickly and easily. And then, you know, originally I had some ideas that were kind of against the initial concept that I mentioned of just grabbing your friends and going and doing something. What I loved about adding Lane to it was that he added a pedigree of horror to it, but he was still a guy I just hung out with on like a weekly basis at the time. So it was true to the concept of just grabbing your friends and making a movie. Um, but I kind of steered away from that in my initial thoughts, like to Boris DeWitt, who's played wonderfully by Bill Pacer. And I can't imagine anyone else doing the things that Bill was willing to do. And that ultimately that's why I went with him because I knew he would be up for it. But originally I wanted to get Edwin Neal, the hitchhiker from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Who I'd actually emailed with years ago. He's a very accessible guy, very friendly guy. And I thought that'd be great to have like Lane, who's in these movies that are about to come out and pair him with like this traditional classic character from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Edwin Neal. But I soon realized like it was so against the idea of what I wanted to do. Um, and I knew Bill from something that I tried to do years before. And he told me the scene, the scene for the character in that uh, had no nudity involved at all, but he pitched to me, he said, well, what if, you know, before I go commit these murders, there's a scene of me in my bedroom stripping out of my normal clothes and I'm nude and I put on 
the clothes that I wear as the killer. And I was just like, it's really strange to me. And I'm like 19 at the time. Like, it's really strange that he would just basically suggest a way to get himself naked in the movie. I was fascinated by it, but I was, it wasn't right for the film. So once I got away from my Edwin Neal idea, I thought he would be perfect because I know he'll do all this batshit crazy stuff. And I felt like if I couldn't do a lot of really good gore effects, let's really push the limits with the nudity. And uh, then when I reached out to him, he said, why don't you involve my, I think they were engaged at the time, his fiance, LaDonna Allison. And that's kind of how I came up with uh, Debbie Ballou. He was like, I have someone who's willing to do anything, you know, just like I am. So I was like, okay, sure. Why not? And so I had Lane. And then with the detectives, briefly, I'll just say that I had watched Troll 2 and I was talking to some of the Troll 2 actors about teaming up together to be the detectives. And uh, do you can you remember the guy's name from Troll 2, the the dad that's from Alabama? George oh, Hardy. Yes, George yes. Hardy. The guy, so I, it, yeah, he's a, he's a dentist now, isn't he? Or? Yeah, correct. I reached out to him and he kind of seemed like he was blowing me off a little bit. And I just felt like I was wasting my time with him and these ideas of... Uh, of um edwin neal so it just kind of hit me one day like bart wants to act he's my best friend um he could probably do a great job you know doing this and then i don't know what made me think harold could do it because you know he'd never other than that conversation about wanting to ride a horse in a western he'd never mentioned anything like that you know and he's not like a traditional actor in any sense but um once I got that idea in my head, I was like, this is perfect. I know he can do it. And thankfully I was right because his performance is my favorite in the movie. Yes. And the Herald, I, I mean, man, you can't, you can't beat that. I, I, <laughs> I mean, right. And the thing about it is you can't really describe how Harold is in the film until you've seen the film. And then you go, oh yeah, like that's, un that's so <laughs> unique and original. <laughs> He's incredible. Yeah. No one could do what he did. And um, I'm really proud of him because he, a lot of times on low budget stuff, when you're involving your friends, you're always worried that they're not going to show up. And with him, he was great because he would call me a day or two before we were supposed to film. Like, are we still filming, buddy? Like, really excited about it. And I was like, this guy's really serious about doing this, you know? And that made me feel really good. And he would be like, you know, I always wanted to be in a movie, which was crazy to me because I just, you know, from what I knew about him, that wouldn't seem like anything that he even thought about. So the fact that we got to do this and then it got picked up by Troma and that he was able to go to Sidewalk Film Festival with us, you know, and he spoke at the Q&A, like, he's sort of like the hero story of the movie to me that, like, he got to have these weird, you know, still really low-budget movie experiences, but it's just, you know, he's so different than anybody else's in the movie. And you would just have to see it to understand. But I will say this about him. He's a good actor. He takes direction. When I tell him to do something, I would just say it how I wanted him to say it. And he could mimic me better than anybody else could. If you had to direct him that way, other people wouldn't be able to do it. But he could take what I said. If I raised my voice, he would raise his voice just perfect. It was kind of uncanny how good he was at being able to adapt to what I wanted and say the craziest shit in just his own unique way and make it funny. And it, it goes a long way enthusiasm when you're working on a movie that's very, very low budget. I mean, I know with, with Spiritus, you know, in casting that we had a lot of people who were just enthusiastic about it, you know, and that uh, when you do, because that was kind of the whole conceit of, of Spiritus is it was like, well, let's just see what we can do with nothing. And right. It, you know, it's an experiment, basically. It's not meant to be something huge and big and, um, you know, for millions of dollars. It was just an experiment. And uh, so when you're trying something experimental and you're casting, you know, local talent, it, 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 their enthusiasm and their willingness to just show up and, and, and try it is, um, you know, we had casting sessions when we were doing mm -hmm. this that movie and uh, some of the people I'd worked with previous like Rebecca Ivy who plays Samantha in the movie I went to college with did theater with for years she was in all of my short films I made in college it was I like her. she had a great look too 
Yeah, yeah. She's uh, she's, she's a got really, a unique look. Something. She, about her. She's a really good actress, and she's just you know willing to do uh, just about anything. And um, and uh, there's another guy, a theater actor that I worked with back in the days of doing theater, named Lee Bridges, who appears in the movie very very briefly as uh, the character of Marjorie's father. But other than that, most of these uh, guys and gals were all people that were cast through through casting calls and some auditions online. And we found some really great local Alabama talent. There's an actress named Faith Bruner in it who plays Claudia. Yeah, uh, Jerry, Faith is in a lot of stuff. She is really good. I've like, everything. And, and I mean, I, I you know, I. I feel remiss not going down the whole cast list, but I know I was just thinking the same thing, man. Yeah, but you know, I mean, but that's, that's what, a pretty large cast. Oh, and Spiritus. Both of our films. Yeah, yeah, actually, they did. Yeah, they did. It was uh, maybe ambitiously large uh, for Spiritus, but uh, you know, I'm the kind of guy when I write stuff, I don't like to ever have like guy number one, guy number two. I want everybody to have a name and a purpose for being there. So it was like, mm -hmm. um, you know, so that was something that, that uh, you know, I, I really wanted to get a kind of a tight cast, but everybody served a purpose. And, uh, and so that's kind of how I wrote it. And obviously when you cast people, you want to get people who don't look like each other, you know, a good mix visually and stuff like that. But that's going to be the case with anything, whether it be theater or film. But uh, I guess we could start moving into now that we've talked the pre-production. I do have a question for you. Yeah, go ahead. Was it tempting for you as an actor, and you're known as an actor for like your next and stuff, you know, you could have played like one of the lead parts in your movie, but I don't even think you didn't make a, even a cameo that I saw or anything like that. So was there a thought process for you? Like, um, did you make a distinct choice of I'm not going to be in this movie? Um, I did. Yeah, basically I did. I, in hindsight, I don't know if that was necessarily the smartest choice. I think to put myself in the movie would have helped the movie ultimately mm -hmm. uh, in terms of getting distribution and uh, getting people's interest. Because if you put my name on a movie as a writer director, I'm not known as a writer or a director. I'm known as an actor. So you always kind of have that hindrance. Now, in hindsight, should I have probably appeared in the movie? I think probably so. But then I thought at the time, like, I I really couldn't see myself in any of those roles. Um, right. You know, had there have been a role that I saw myself in, I certainly would have had no problem, you know, doing it. Uh, um, and in fact, I might do that in the future, direct something that I appear in myself. Uh, in fact, I, I probably will. But... Um, but no, that's a good question. I had considered it, but I pretty much dismissed it pretty quickly right away. Don't know if it was the smartest choice, but it just seemed like the right creative choice at the time. I'll say this. I think, you know, it was the right choice just because it's a bold choice as an actor to make to not put yourself in your film, especially at the level that we're at, you know. Um, I thought it was a, a bold choice. And ultimately, it helps you just make the movie as a director. And now you can move on if you want to be in the, the movies you make in the future, that's fine. But I think it was probably good for you just to have that experience of directing the movie because there's that added side to it because I'm in a movie called The Lonely that I'm working on. It's in post where I directed it. I'm in basically every scene. And I love that. I love the fact that I have to focus on both of these you know, things, but there is something to be said for just directing your movie, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I, and I, I wore a lot of hats on that, on Spiritus. I, I you know, co-produced it and I wrote it and, and I directed it, but I also shot it. I think if, if I was to act in something, there would have to be obviously a DP because I couldn't do yes, that. Yes, right. And Absolutely. That's, that's the position I've been in too, where it's like I could play in this movie, which would help the film get made, but I'm also going to shoot the movie. So that makes it pretty difficult. You know, you yeah. got to be on one side or the other at that point. Right. And there are some projects that I would love to do that I have in my mind as a writer that I, there's a part of me that was like, I'd like to direct it. But at the same time, I don't know if I would want to direct it and play the kind of parts I'm thinking about, you know, so mm -hmm. it's just a lot. It's a lot. Well, 
it's a lot easier to be a, an actor and not have to do the production side of it. You know, uh, I'm glad, and, and every so often I'll get the gumption to say I'm going to direct something. But, um, yeah, it's hard. it's hard work. It's a hard, hard job. Absolutely. And just in general, making a movie, whether or not you have a big crew or a small crew, it's going to push you to your limits. Sometimes I feel more comfortable when it's just the real intimate, smaller group of people and you have more responsibility. But um, I think that's just easier for my personality sometimes than once you get to a certain point of like the number of crew that you have. I guess it's just you learn as you go and it's you got to get used to that. But like Unfinished Business, uh, another horror I have in post. It's the biggest crew we have for principal, and it wasn't a big crew by any stretch of the imagination, but it was the biggest, most professional crew I had ever had. And it was a little overwhelming for me, but and I don't feel like the movie turned out the way I wanted it to, but it was a great experience because at some point I'm gonna have to have a crew even bigger than that. So you're slowly just, you know, developing and honing these skills and getting used to new things and uh trying new challenging things. And um, it's all beneficial to the end result, which is just making you a better filmmaker. Right. Yeah. And with, with Spiritus, we had a crew. It was the biggest crew I'd ever worked with at directing. Because I, like I said, I directed things in college, short films and stuff. But this was the first, well, technically it's not the first feature film I've directed. But it's the first feature film that anyone's ever seen that right. I directed. And it had a crew and there were always a bunch of people around and it was a great crew. I, we got really lucky that the experience of actually shooting the movie was very easy. It went very well. There was a lot of weather type issues and heat. As you know, in Alabama, it's hot as fuck. And we oh, shot, yeah. shot in the middle of summer on this thing. And there we shot a lot of the stuff in summer too for the segment at the hotel. And there's a lot of driving scenes in the car. And yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Poor Lane was just like pouring sweat, man, like pouring sweat. He had to wipe himself off. It's just like, I'm surprised that um, we were able to, to do it for as long as we did. It was just unbearable. Now with the shoot, did you do a, con a, a concentrated shoot or was it spread out? Over oh man, it was spread out over years. I mean, we would shoot. The, the great thing about Bill Pacer and LaDonna, they could travel together, but they were in Atlanta. We didn't really have any money. We'd bring them in for a weekend, shoot as much as we could. And, you know, poor Bill had to come back and forth probably close to seven or eight times before we were completely done. And I started in 2011, but by 2013, Pumpkin was kind of coming to the end. You know, we'd shoot. And then for months, I wouldn't work on the movie at all, you know. I'd edit it and get kind of like, oh, is this any good? Is this crazy? Have I fucked up? Have I made a major mistake with my life? You know, you've seen it, so you can imagine editing some of that stuff in Pumpkin and just being like, ugh. Because, <laughs> you know, it's a movie within a movie, but I started just with the bad movie shot on VHSC, so that's all I had. I didn't have the documentary stuff. And, in fact, we talked about casting. I didn't really talk about casting the documentary because it really was like making two different movies. We didn't really start the documentary stuff until late 2013. Uh, maybe I'm a little wrong on that, but the bulk of it was 2013 until like 2014, and then the movie was pretty much done as far as shooting. But um, yeah, it was completely spread out, completely spread out. Sometimes we wouldn't work on it for months, you know? Yeah, yeah. I. I, I, with this, with Spiritus shoot, we we did it um, on weekends because of the availability of the actors, who were the local actors, and uh, we did do it, it. It took quite a few months, but we did every weekend until it was done. You know, so it wasn't the way a concentrated shoot would be, say like your next, where you just start and you work through the week, and you, it's like a job. You know, this right? Was, we Completely did it on, different animal. Oh, yeah, yeah. We did it on weekends and stuff, you know, uh, on the availability of the various people. And we would try to, I know, on the availability of the special effects, uh, Samika Spratley did a great job. Uh, I on... love Samika. Yeah, I wanted to comment on that. I thought all of that stuff was really, really effective. It was great. Her effects are great. Marjorie's character, when she shows up, is great, man. It's, it's very effective. Samika's someone that I have a lot of respect for. And um, I've worked with her on the same project kind of spread out just like we were talking about when everyone's available. She did some reshoots on unfinished business for me and uh, 
I just think she's great. She's uh, she's a lot of fun to be around. Yeah, she's very good and very quick. She had to, on Spiritus, the, with the character of Marjorie, she had to airbrush this whole thing and do all this detail work. And I do uh, very extensive, like I'm here. I could actually show you. Do you want to see the Spiritus book that I came, that I produced? Hell yeah. Absolutely. Uh, this is something I've done on everything if I direct it. This this enormous monster here. Wow. Is Spiritus and it's a Bible. Yeah, this is so um, the reason I'm showing this and talking about Samika is because I had storyboarded this fucking thing. And I mean I storyboarded every scene of this thing. And I don't know if I can show it, but there it is upside down. Yeah. You know? And so I went through this whole process of storyboarding it for the idea that, okay, I can show Samika, okay, and here we need an arm, here we need a head. Here we, so we, she wouldn't have to right. do the whole thing. Because, you know, being an actor in um, effects stuff, I know how much of a pain in the ass it is to get completely in makeup only to have your hand shot, you know, or something like that. So I tried yeah, to yeah. <laughs> That's one thing that I learned being an actor going into directing is I tried to make the actor's life far more, far easier. You know what I mean? Right. Um, Cause that, that, you know, when you're acting and when you're doing makeup, it's very tough. I did this movie and I'm never going to mention the name of it. You probably know it cause I've mentioned it to you. I'm sure. But I was in fucking makeup for four or five hours. They'd get me to the set and I'd sit there and play cards all day. Yeah. <laughs> It was insane. I'm thinking, you guys, you don't, you guys don't know how to schedule a fucking movie. If you have somebody, if you go through the expense of putting an actor into makeup and the time and the hours of it, you utilize them. You, you, you always schedule, and you schedule every scene you could have with that effect. And it's, yeah. just, it's, it's useless, amazing how often of, that doesn't happen. Where it is what you're talking about. Where it's like, well, you're just sitting around killing time, and then they don't even get to you. Right. Yeah. It's like, uh, you know, you're basically a living effect. And if you if you go through the ex and it is costly to because every time you take off one of those pieces, like if it's a foam rubber deal, that's destroyed. You got to make another one, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, it, to me, I was always sitting on the sets of those movies thinking when I was an actor thinking, you know, I could have scheduled this so much better. You just I would have gotten all this out of the way by now, you know, but right. Yeah, unfortunately, I've been the director on one of those sets where it's like, I think one day on Unfinished Business, we had a guy go into makeup, um, which really was just aging makeup, which is still a pain. But uh, yeah, I don't think we shot him that day because things were just, man, that was like one of the most grueling experiences of my life was that movie, which is a completely different uh, interview or discussion. But I did, I wanted to give a shout out to... Um, one of the actors in Pumpkin that I didn't mention yet, um, Richard Tate, Dick Tate, who plays the old man in the horse mask, who saws uh, Johnny's arm off, and then he's there at the end with the clown and stuff. Um, he was somebody that actually passed away during the making of the movie. He had lung cancer. He was obviously a very old man. But I just wanted to give a shout out to him and a few other people because... With Dick, he was always willing to act. I mean, he had been in probably over 100 stage plays throughout his life and even local stuff in Decatur, Alabama. I met him at an open casting call for the same movie I, I mentioned earlier that never got finished that I met Bill through, Bill Pacer. But, man, Dick was just such a great guy. He would do – I was always worried, like, you know, he there's some cuss, curse words in his it, it, for his character in Pumpkin, and I was worried, like, this old – you know, nice. Set. He plays Santa Claus at Christmas. That was his job. He would be the mall Santa. It's like, he's not going to be in this movie. You know, he's going to be like, what are you kids, you lunatics trying to get me to do? But he would take it and run with it and add more to it and go above and beyond every time. And it was really a shame that, you know, we lost him when we did. But looking back at the time it took to make the Nobody story in 2011, and so it really being done and released on VOD in 2017 and then DVD uh, this year, you know, four people passed away that were involved in the movie. And that and then five or six, if you count like, you know, I was really close to Lane at the time. His grandmother passed away during the making father through that whole process as well. And then Dick passed away while we were making it. He was in it. The narrator at the beginning, uh, who was one of, when I moved to Moulton, Alabama, where I am now. He was one of my first friends. Uh, he he had cancer and passed away. 
Zach Harding, who's like a brother to all of us, actually passed away and it, it was a suicide, um, which was a shocking thing for all of us. And Sheila Hill, who's interviewed at the beginning of the film, is Randy Hill's wife. She passed away uh, within the last two years. And um, did I name all of them? I guess I did. I got really lost in that thought, man. But yeah, it's just like when you watch the movie, it's really hard to, even now, it still feels like so recent since it's just been released. It's just weird the number of people that we lost through the process, process of it. So you know, Zach and Dick and uh, Sheila and Mark. It's just, uh, it's crazy, man. And I know your film has a RIP at the end of it for someone that, that you lost. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was, um, there was a fellow named uh, Jake who I was good friends with um, in my area. And I was gonna, I'd written a role in Spiritus for him to, to appear in. And uh, it was the role, actually, that uh, Gerard Jackson played in the movie. Who, he's the guy that sets up the Fight Club, and um, does. And there's a scene in the movie involving like a like a staged fight thing, and um, and I wrote that for Jake, and I thought, well, that's perfect, and Jake's all excited about it. And then uh, you know, one day I get on Facebook, and I see you know the, the, on his Facebook page uh, that people are, are putting their condolences in. And I'm like, what the hell? So yeah. I, I call up, you know, someone that a mutual friend, and they said, uh, well, you know, he was murdered last night. And wow. I said, I said, oh my God, like what happened? And apparently, uh, there was an uh, an altercation, and he was shot by a friend of his, and then taken out to the interstate, and his body dumped in the woods. Wow. And uh, this happened, you know, maybe five minutes from my house. And it was absolutely shocking and, uh, you know, devastating uh, because he was such a good guy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'd already written the movie and I felt like, you know, there were so many mm -hmm. odd similarities between something I'd written and something that kind of happened. And it, it, it uh, since he was going to be in the movie, and he was going to play a, a you know a fair sized part in the movie. I felt uh, it was only right to dedicate the film ultimately to his memory. And so, because when I think of Spiritus, I still think of him, especially when I think of pre production and the casting and stuff, because he was he was yeah. definitely somebody I was talking to the whole the whole time. But that's why that dedication is at the end of of Spiritus for my friend Jake. It was interesting that you bring up the similarities about your friend who you lost and the movie that you made, because as I mentioned with my friend Zach, who ended up committing suicide in this movie is so much about suicide. It was really weird, man, to, to be at the tail end of it, you know, the deal with trauma's done and everything. And then he, he does that, which was unexpected to say the least, but, um, just, you know, when you go back and now watch the movie, I know it's very hard for some people to watch it because he's in it. He plays Warren's brother. Warren's character commits suicide. Um, and Zach's character actually reads the suicide letter in the movie. Um, but it's like what you were saying about how similar your movie is to real life. I feel the same way about the nobodies. But it's also weird. Just I think Lane and I talked about this on the commentary where it's like, even though we hadn't dealt with someone uh, close to us committing suicide before so much of what's in the documentary where they talk about how they found out and how it affected them does play so much more authentic now that we've lived through something like that in real life. And I know that it's important to us as we move forward to kind of, you know, raise awareness for suicide prevention. Not that we really have any good advice or, you know, we don't have the answers obviously, but I think it's important to have a discussion about, about those type of things and, and raise awareness to it. You know, we put the suicide hotline number at the end of the film and we hope to do more things like that, but it's just more complicated than I can really get into. But um, it's weird how, you know, the nobodies was about life imitating art and art imitating life. And then you get done with that movie and it's like something basically so similar to your movie happens to you in real life. And, uh, just with the talk of all the people that passed away. And then of course with Jake on your end, um, it's a sobering thought to think about even just with people passing away from old age, you know, 
the number of people that, I mean, you're, we're making movies. We're capturing these moments on screen. At some point we're going to look back and all these people are going to be gone. We're going to be gone. So it's, it really makes you think about that aspect of what we're doing with the way we're basically preserving these people forever through, you know, what we capture on the screen. Yeah, absolutely. You ever think sometimes like when, when you're gone, people will go back and look at these movies and decide who you were based on your work. I've thought about this before. Yeah. I mean, it's absolutely true. I think that's hopefully we'll be in a position where people actually care enough about our work to go back and, and look at them. Um, uh, there's a Werner Herzog quote that I'm paraphrasing where he talks about um, it's sort of on this subject. He's basically more talking about when you're making films and you're editing and you're putting it all together, be sure you're getting what you really want on screen because one day your grandkids are going to see this, you know, make sure that it's something that when your grandkids see it, you can be proud of it and feel like you, you picked the right take or got the right performance, you know? Well, that's, that's a great point. Um, that's a good quote. Uh, have you, was there anything on the nobodies you look back at now and think, um, man, I, I kind of wish I had done that differently or something. You oh yeah. Forgot? Always. Yeah. Um, Same here. Well, you go ahead. I'll, I'll chime in as well. Um, well, I mean, when, you know, you look back and when you do a movie of a lower budget, obviously there are going to be technical kind of snafus that you can't get around and, and you have the idea in your head and, and it's a perfect thing in your head. And then you try and do it. And the moment you start shooting, the compromises begin. And so you start to kind of look at it and go, well, how can I get this as close to what, what I envision as I want, knowing it won't be perfect because of technical and budgetary limitations. And uh, for me, I look back and I, I, I don't, I'm not unrealistic about thinking I can get my script to, because the spirit has had a very detailed script and I was really happy with it and everything. And um, so, and then when we started shooting it, you know, things, some things changed, but essentially if you read the script for Spiritus and watch the movie, it's pretty similar. Um, in fact, it's very similar. Um, mm -hmm. But I look back and I think, yeah, there are always things that, that I'm trying to think of a specific example of something. Uh, there are some things that actually worked out better because of those limitations or not being able to get, say, like a location. There's a scene in the movie that was meant to be shot at a whole different house. And it's the scene where a character comes into uh, the Marjorie, the girl who's died's house and is searching around for something. And the original house I wanted to shoot that in was a real creepy looking old house. It's probably been around for a hundred years. We couldn't shoot in that house like last minute. And so we had to improvise and there's a um, great uh, uh, Jamie. She worked on the production side and she could find anybody in any location. She was a great one. And she found this house that was actually her parents' house. I think a very modern house. Mm -hmm. And we went in there and we shot in there instead. And it actually had all these like weird corridors and rooms and stuff. It turned out you could, uh, I had the, the storyboard I showed you before. I had to throw that totally out. And I just kind of walked through the house that day because we shot it in one night and just started, re you know, I was talking and the production designer um, and the producer were jotting stuff down. And I just did a new storyboard, basically a shot list. And then, But it turned out better than actually what I was envisioning for the other location. So there are things like that that actually are, are much, much better because of the budget. Yeah, I, I have that happen all the time. Um, you know, even like one thing I would say that I know I could do better now and pumpkin was always supposed to look kind of bad cause it's this low budget movie, but I shot it myself and just having worked alongside like, uh, Ryan Sims, who's a great DP here in North Alabama, Chris Hillicky, who, you know, he's a fantastic DP as well. Um, I'm not that good by any means, but just watching them and learning from them. If I had to shoot this movie over again and I was still going to shoot on VHS and everything, I could still light it so much better. And it wouldn't like take away from the fact that it's a bad movie. You know, if anything, it would make it just more fun and easier to watch and more visu visually appealing. But um, yeah, you also have those moments where something that you feel like may be an issue at the time ends up being better because of what you had to workshop in the moment um i can't think of anything specific but it does happen where something that seems like it's a problem at the time ends up being a blessing because of how it affects the way you 
work through it on set and stuff like that. And don't you find that's just a pure luck thing? Like sometimes it's just fortune it has a lot to do with independent, low budget or no budget filmmaking. You know, you just at the whim of the film gods, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's magic that happens. And if you're fortunate enough to capture it, um, you definitely the film gods have smiled upon you. I mean, there are a lot of things I could think of in Spiritus that had we had a couple million dollars would have been perfect, you know, but, uh, right. but that's the case, I think, on, on any film. Even if you have a couple million dollars, you look at it and you go, well, if I had $10 million, this would right. be Right, if we had good. more money, we could have done more. But yeah. money would be a problem, too. It can, you know, if having money and not having experience or having someone on your team who has experience and, you know, how to allot that money and use it, it's like, well... It can you can waste that money, you know. Yes, very true, very true. Um, so with the editing, like, okay, so you shot it over a long. Did you edit it over a long period of time? Yeah, yeah. So I was basically editing as I went on Pumpkin, and you know, I would get to points where it's like, ah, I'm kind of burnt out on it, or I'm depressed in real life, and um, I've come to accept that I am lazy, but it's not out of like the standard, uh, like I guess. Not necessarily standard, but you know, when you say lazy, that implies to people that you just don't want to do something. But I'm never lazy out of not wanting to do something. I just get in ruts where I'm always thinking about what I need to do and how to do it. But sometimes I just can't get myself to do it. I'm either burnt out or I don't know the answer. So that's why, you know, with real life and just the limitations of the budget and stuff like that, that all creates this kind of world that you live in where it can take you years to complete your little VHS movie. But um, I would edit as I went and then come back to it two, three months later with a fresher perspective and more motivation. And I still find that to be true with everything I work on. Um, but there was really a point in 2013 where towards the end of the year where I had enough of the documentary and I had all the pumpkin and I finally started to put them together and see like, them play off each other and i i pretty much worked two weeks straight where i would just get up and go to work you know and i was excited i didn't care about anything else it was really the most creative period of my life and one of the most rewarding because i was so happy to see all that stuff finally connect and i felt like hey we got something that kind of works here you know so really in 2013 towards the end of the year is when the movie really took shape and uh at that point, it was just working out the kinks, trimming things out, re-edits and stuff like that, and a lot of festival rejections and, you know, ultimately finding distribution through trauma. Now, don't you find that, because we were talking before about how people, if you have a lot of money, that can sometimes be a hindrance. Like, say, if you had a lot of money and you were doing it as a straight shoot where you just... Because what the thing about those kind of shoots, something like your next, is once this train starts rolling, it's rolling and it's not going to stop to the end. In some ways, it can have a, it can be a great luxury creatively to shoot it over a long period of time because you can stop, you can do what you did and edit it, and then see what you need. And they, that's not something you could ever do on a on a huge budgeted. I mean, it's just you just can't. I mean, maybe you could get them to give you a little money to go back and reshoot, but they don't tend to like to do that. So yeah, it kind of seems to only work for people like us where, and I, you know, Lane was someone who always said this to me and it stuck with me because it made so much sense. He would say like, no one's expecting our movies. No one's at no producers asking where's the cut of the movie. No one's waiting to go see our movie. So we got all the time in the world. And I really took that to heart, maybe even too much with some of the time I took, but uh, you know, we have that luxury. And then if you have, $300 million in your budget and you need to reshoot something, sure, they could give you more money to go do that. If it's, oh, we need to go reshoot some of that fight scene in Star Wars, yeah, okay, we're going to do that, right? Like, they're not going to be like, no, you can't do that. M more times than not, you know, they're going to let you do it. But um, I have been in a situation where Unfinished Business was like, we're going to shoot this movie over like 17 to 20 days and then a few more days at a different location. A month later, it's going to be done. And thankfully, that wasn't the case because if we just had to cut the movie from those shoots, it would be really, really bad. And now it's going to be, you know, it's going to be all right. It's not going to be great, but it's a lot better than it would have been if we just had to live and die with what we shot over that, you know, three-week shoot or whatever. Yeah. So 
time is absolutely a blessing because every movie I've ever made has all had the same type of time put into it. And all those movies got better each year with reshoots or just re-edits. And uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, hopefully when you shoot something where you have a lot of money with the right preparation and the right crew around you, you don't need to go do all that stuff. But if you're doing something at this budget level, more times than not, you probably should spend at least a year reshooting something, you know, and editing as you go and asking yourself new questions, writing new scenes, because ultimately it's going to make your movie better. And what Lane said is absolutely right. Because if, if you don't have a deadline, there's no, and there's nobody like saying, hurry up because we're spending money. There's no reason not to get it right. In some ways I could probably mm -hmm. still be working on Spiritus. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so, real quick, I'll just say this. It's what he said is absolutely right. And then another thing that we would do was like, well, let's put a deadline. Like we want to submit to this festival. It's just a working deadline. It's not the end of the world if you miss it, but it kind of keeps you on track so that you don't let it go too long, which I do let my stuff go a little too long. I, on the other end of that spectrum is, you know, when are you going to say it's done? You have to be able to say at some point, I can't do anything else. And I think maybe that's kind of hard for me to do. I just keep pushing it and pushing it. Like, no, I can still make it a little bit better. At some point, you just have to look at it and say it is what it is. And sure, you can work on it another year, but you kind of just have to do the finishing touches that you have the money to do and put it out. So I have, I have to say that I don't are in one direction. I don't have the patience to be Orson Welles. I mean, I, I yeah. could not work on the same movie for 30 years, shooting a scene here, there and everywhere. And just right. say, because I think with a lot, honestly, with Orson Welles, I really think he just didn't want to finish some of those movies. You know, he just wanted to have yeah. something to work on. And there's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with that. I mean, he wants to have something to work on. Okay. I mean, you might not want to have 20 things to work on that never get done, but you might, you know, I can understand that. But I yeah. could never do that because I, I, I mean, I'm just not built that way. I got to eventually finish the project, you know. And, yeah. Uh, Three to four years is plenty of time. And that's kind of where I'm at. And I hope to the next stuff I the next projects I tackle, I feel like are going to be at a budget level where that's just not going to be acceptable. So you better have all your ducks in the row and have everything. I need my binders to look like your binders, you know, and, and get in there and get things done and and move on. Yeah, well, that's. I'm a big, like, I'm a huge preparation guy because I, even as an actor, I mean, it's just kind of built into me. I hate being on a set, as, even as an actor, where I'm just like, okay, what am I doing? You know, yeah. I, I just don't, I don't like that. I, I don't like not knowing my lines and stuff. So when I went into directing mode on Spiritus, it was just like, I was fucking crazy with this preparation. But it helped in the long run because we were shooting consecutive weekends and, I got a little bit of the luxury of during the week because I edited as we went to mm -hmm. and uh, I got throughout the week to look at it. And then we would always have some more days uh, the following weekend if we needed to, to go back and reshoot, which we did reshoot. We had to reshoot uh, some things and or, or just it happens. Yeah. Yeah. Because there are things that happen, you know, actors can't show up, don't show up, whatever. You lose a location. Well, you, that scene doesn't, you know, so we can't do this scene, but that scene has to be there in order to bridge these two scenes. So you have to figure out what's in between. And if you have a little time to think about that where you're not too rushed, it's because, uh, you know, like I always tell people when you're writing, even in prose, not even in film, the transitions are important. You know, how one thing flows into another thing. It's like the rhythm of a song. You can't have, there has to be a beat there. You, you, you ever get yeah. that feeling when you're editing or when you're writing? It's like that you, it's, there's a beat to the way things go. And if you miss a beat, something feels wrong. So you have to get something in there. And there were some times on Spiritus where it was like, okay, that doesn't quite meet that. So I have to have some right bridge here. Did you try to shoot in order? No, no, it was all out of order. Yeah. And mine, I mean, for the nobodies and really anything I've done, Honestly, probably that nobody's was the most in order in terms of at least like, let's try to shoot. Well, that's that's not right either, because we shot the first segment, which was the hotel stuff. And that's really the second story in Pumpkin. But I think that the more in order you can go, the better. 
because it helps with some of that stuff that you're talking about just by being able to make sure that the actors are in the right headspace of where they are within the story so they know where to be emotionally and stuff like that. That's ultimately going to help the way your film feels in terms of pacing and everything too. Now I can say and that it in the, doesn't work. It sticks out, you know, it's like, why yeah. something doesn't feel right with these performances. I can say that we, within the sections within Spiritus, they were sort of shot in order, but the, but the sections weren't shot consecutively, if that makes sense. Cause it doesn't really make sense if you hadn't seen the movie, but Spiritus sort of has, it's not an anthology, but it has those it has some nonlinear stuff, which I really like that aspect of it. And I did want to ask you about that. Um, how much was it structured the way it is in terms of the final film from the script stage? Or did you reorder things in the edit saying, ah, I could, the storytelling would be better if I put this here and move this to the middle and stuff like that. Cause you seems like you would have opportunities to do a lot of that stuff in post, almost like, a way to rewrite your script because you're just moving these pieces around because they're already a little bit out of order. Yeah. It was actually all done in writing. All of that was, okay, gotcha. um, yeah, it was, everything was ordered in writing and I thought it out before I even started writing in terms kind of made a graph of, you know, this character, this character, and this character, this line, you know, this event happens, which lines up with the line and this character. I'm so fucking anal, man. You can probably tell from the book. Yeah. But I did all that in the writing. And when I write, I always, because I know some writers who will write different parts of different, you know, if I'll start at the end and they'll write the middle. I have to write consecutively from the Me beginning. Too. Yeah. Me too. Yeah, I can't think in that way of like, well, and, and sometimes yes. that they, they'll, I, this is something I've noticed. They're like, well, I don't want to write the boring parts first. I want to get to the good. But uh, here's the thing. If you're writing a boring part, then chances are people are going to be watching a boring part. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you have to make it where nothing is boring. That's kind of the fun of writing is if you get to that bit where you go, oh, God, I got to write this scene so I can get to that scene. You have to figure out how to make that scene you don't want to write exciting. Yeah. Or, or realize like why don't I like this scene? What should this scene be instead that maybe would be more fun? Yeah, um, probably you got to start problem solving it. Whatever works. If people, I, and I know that people do write like that. I don't know any personally, but um, you know whatever works. Hey, that's great. But to me, it's like if I know the ending and I'm like really excited by the ending of something, and I go out to write it, that's the reward to me. Getting to the end so you can write that scene. Like you've got to go through all that other stuff to get to that big payoff that you see in your head. And a lot of times it starts to change. I don't know how you are, but like I'm structured to a sense that I know most of the beats and okay, this, this act and this act is kind of how it's going to flow. And, you know, but I don't have it all figured out. I may know if it's going to be three acts where things kind of move in those acts, but I may figure out something in the writing. And that's usually when I have the most fun. It's like, what if we just went here? What if this character did this? And then it starts to solve a lot of the problems that you might've had when you were just writing out the outline and stuff. Yeah. I, when I write kind of, I do the, the big beats and then I discover things between, mm -hmm. you know, I'll, I'll know the kind of, I'll know if it's a screenplay, I'll know the ending and I'll know like a, the, the key little twists and plot points, if you want to call them that. But I don't do a scene by scene outline. I, I just move from beat to beat and move in little sections. Like I'll, I'll break a, I'll break a film down, say into, you know, nine, 10 page sections. And I know that by the page 10, I got to get to this. And by page 20, I got to get to this. And how that helps me is it helps me focus. I don't get lost on tangents. I know, okay, well, this is the end point for this section. And so I have to get there in 10 pages. And that kind of is a challenge to me because I'm like, you know, I have to tell myself, okay, don't get lost. Don't go into weirdo Elsie Holtville, you know, just <laughs> try. <laughs> it gets, the it gets, are so fun though man i wrote i finished the script uh, a couple weeks ago that's a rewrite of the first movie i ever tried to make and i did ultimately make it but i want to remake it one day with some real money and it's kind of a it's a vampire comedy kind of coming of age story in a weird way and um i've realized that like my sensibilities for comedy are the tangents where it's like all this stuff's going on and like this vampire world of like you need to be concerned about this with the main characters or just like on some tangent somewhere about something else through like dialogue and i've realized like 
probably not good for anything else I write, but it works really well for the way I want this movie to be, just in the sense that, like, you have these characters that have kind of, like, um, they're, they've locked themselves away in this room where they think they're safe, and they're just talking about, like, the most ridiculous stuff. And uh, it is a tangent, absolutely. It is. Uh, I really love it, though. You know who does tangent movies the best? Who's that? Jim Jarmish. Okay. Jim Jarmusch is like Mr. Jim Jarmusch stuff. So. Yeah, Jim Jarmusch is like Mr. Tangent. He's like, I'm going to start with one story and then I'm going to go in every possible direction I can. But somehow it kind of works, you know. It's it's very Jim Jarmusch. So I wanted to ask you what while we're talking about um, writing, do you study a lot of these? Like, you know, there's a lot of people that teach classes or they're just interviews that they've done about their tips and techniques do you pay attention to that type of stuff or you just kind of develop your own philosophy and, and do it from there i started out reading a lot of books on writing and particularly on structure and uh and then what i did basically is i just got it in my head and then i developed what works for me um i, I think it's good to start on the basis of just at least uh looking at and understanding those things even if you don't agree with them and yeah yeah you know, you integrate it into your brain before you even, you know, you don't even know you're doing it. And then you kind of look back later and go, yeah, okay, I, I see maybe a structural thing that helped me there that I read in some book. But I, I don't, right. I don't kill myself. You know, you have to kind of find a balance where you're not going to kill the story by overstructuring it, but you don't want to just be totally willy nilly, I guess. Yeah, I guess it goes back to that old saying of like, in order to break the rules, you got to know the rules to a certain extent. Exactly. That's exactly well put. That's how I kind of view it. Uh, I I find myself, you know, still looking up or stumbling upon, you know, like Film Courage has a lot of really good stuff from different screenwriters. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to do a, a Film Courage video about the nobodies. But, uh, you know, I was watching some of their stuff. Last night they got one that's like an hour and a half. It's just basically compilation of all these different screenwriting experts or writers at least giving different advice and they chopped into one video so it kind of goes from this to this you know all these different people talking and you know it can be really overwhelming to me at least when I hear all these people talking about things and I start to put it in the perspective as I'm analyzing it being like it really depresses me sometimes I'm like oh man I don't know what I'm doing but then I you know I just I try to think about movies I really like and think about those scripts and you know like i'm really big on this kick right now there's a script i'm working on where it's like well one of the characters i'm trying to figure out how to develop the character better and they need to be developed more and it's kind of a twist that they become such a central character but i guess what i'm getting at is when i think about like halloween which we both love the original um i have a feeling that as good as the script probably was in terms of getting the action across and everything the character of Laurie Strode, if you didn't, if you hadn't seen Halloween and you just read that script, you would probably look at it and be like, eh, she doesn't really do a whole lot. You know, there's not a whole lot remarkable about her. It's Jamie Lee Curtis that makes Laurie Strode who she is and makes so many people love that character. So I agree. I, there's, you know, when you think about, you can overthink your script for sure. Like you can try to do too much, but sometimes, especially if you're going to direct it yourself, that's why I keep reminding myself, it's like, as long as you feel good about where you're at and, you know, so much of it's going to be the casting and what happens on the day on set. Um, I'm sorry, that was a tangent in itself. I'm, <laughs> I don't find that. Well, I can honestly say there was one thing I did very deliberately in, in terms of writing Spiritus is I, I made sure because I knew I was working with local talent. I, I wasn't going to put them in a situation where they had to do like Tarantino monologues. You know, I, yeah. I wanted to make sure even if I couldn't find and the cast is great and I'm glad I found the people I found. But just in case, I wanted to make sure that could this film survive basically with as little dialogue as possible. And that was something I went into very consciously doing with, with Spiritus, which doesn't have a lot of dialogue, which is great when it comes to closed captioning it for streaming. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great point about the closed captioning, but also just in the terms of knowing what you were getting into at the budget level 
and trying to make it easier for your actors, which is something I've never done. <laughs> I've never been that responsible. Yeah. That's way too talky, I think. Or it ha some of it has been, for sure. Well, um, we are getting nearer the end point here, and I think, I just have the feeling we could keep on talking about these movies forever, because we didn't really even get into distribution. Correct, yeah. Which uh, I must say that I did something that's part of this experiment that I'll probably live to regret, which is I'm self-distributing Spiritus. I think it's great. Do you really? Yeah, yeah, I do. You know, I'm really big on the idea of self-distribution. And to me, if I couldn't get a name, and from is a name, you may hear that name and be like, ugh, but it's a name, you know, but if we couldn't get that, I would have done what you did. I wouldn't want it to be just put out by some company that maybe would get it to more people, but you know, you've never heard of them. Well, why should they get my movie? And, and, and if it does make any money, I'm never going to see it from that company, you know, just like I'm not going to see it from Troma. It wasn't about money though. But if we couldn't get a name that felt right for the movie, which Troma feels right for the movie, then just do it yourself and try to build your own audience. What I really hope to do is that if I ever want to revisit the nobodies, and, you know, like those two detectives, for example, I do have thoughts of maybe revisiting them in a different Warren Warner movie down the road. Um, now that Trump has put it out, Trump is helping me grow my own self distribution. If I want to put that movie out later and just do it myself. Um, so trauma made sense for me. But ultimately, I really love the idea of just doing it yourself and trying to build your own community. Yeah. Well, that's what we're attempting with with Spiritus, which I have. This this year, if you actually want to buy this this film, Spiritus, that I wrote and directed, the only way you can get it right now is through me. Eventually, it'll be on streaming services. But if you want a DVD, you got to come to this guy right here. That's and, awesome. But if you want the nobodies, you got to go to Troma now. Is that is that right? Um, you can get it on Amazon, the DVD. You can stream it on Troma now. It's on Troma Direct, which is their web store for physical media. And I mean, it's on like walmart.com and stuff like that, which is all great. But if you go buy it, I mean, I'm not making any money off of it. I'll probably never make a, a penny off of it. But uh, we actually do real quick. I'll say this. Um, eventually, as part of the deal that I worked out with Troma, I get to do a limited collector's edition DVD, um, which I'm going to load with features. And that will be self-distributed. And so I'm hopeful that we can get that out by maybe next fall or something. But uh yeah, I'm looking forward to that because I really, you know, hate to be that guy, but I held back a lot of stuff for the DVD. Like, it's very bare bones, the Trouble one, but there's a lot of stuff that I can put on the uh, collector's edition because I didn't want to put a lot of that stuff on there and then it just basically be the same disc, you know? Yeah. Well, that's great, though. That's a great deal because now you can have control over your own um, collect your own material. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which is very uh, rare, <laughs> uh, which is why I, I'm enjoying doing, I'm hoping to do more prose writing. I'm actually working on a short story collection right now. Um, of course, the, the ultimate challenge of that is, does anybody read anymore? But we'll find out. I think uh, so. I think so. I've always been fascinated by, you know, doing crossover stuff, novelizations of your movies or like similar things like that. That would be kind of fun to do with uh, Spiritus, probably, with a novelization. And I might do it in some sort of a written form at some point. But uh, I'll cross that bridge when I get there. Right now, we got to wrap up this show. Um, but so, yeah, you can if you want to buy Spiritus, I'll show it to you one more time. You'll have to contact me, and I'll give you the details on how to buy it. It'll be coming streaming soon. If you want to get The Nobodies by Jay Burleson, uh, go to all the trauma platforms or um, Amazon. You can find it any kind of place like that. Jay, I want to thank you for being on the show yet again. I think we had a pretty interesting discussion about our process of making oh, these crazy films. I was glad to do it. I just want to give a quick shout out to Stephen Byro. He runs Unearthed Films. He's actually, uh, I talked to him through Chris Hillicky, who shot one of their recent films. He was the one that uh, told me, any deal you make, make sure you get collector's edition run to at least like 200, 300 copies. Um, so that wasn't something I thought up on my own. He actually told me that and it was great advice. Yeah. Yeah, it is great Thanks advice. Lot, Stephen Byro. Steve, you're the man. Um, and Jay, you're the man. I appreciate you you're coming. The man. On the show. No, I you're the fun. man. As always, it was great. We'll have to do it yet again.
Oh, yes, we'll do it again, that's for sure. Um, and for you guys watching who celebrate Christmas, I will not Merry see Christmas. you. Yes, Merry Christmas. I will not see you again before it, but I'll see you after it for New Year's. Uh, have a happy Christmas, and I will see you next week. See you later.